thanks to the organizers so for the invitation. It is an honor to give a talk at this conference. It's certainly a sad occasion, but also it is a special occasion to celebrate all the mathematics that was close to the heart of Jean Christophe. So, well, my, one of my first recollections of something associated to Jean Christophe was when I just left the Soviet Union so, uh, and was on my way to the West. So it was 89, late 89, and I was in Italy. One of the first stops was in Italy. And uh, I was introduced to email, just I never, had never seen email before, and it was just appeared, so it was quite amazing. I enjoyed it at that time, not anymore, so, but at that time it <laughs> looked really, looked really amazing. And one of the first messages I received was the message from Adrian Doudi to several people telling them that Jean-Christophe Yacos had just almost proved the MLC conjecture, the conjecture of local connectivity of the Mandelbrot set. Namely, he proved that the Mandelbrot set is locally connected at all parameters which don't belong to a nest of copies of the little Mandelbrot set. Sets. <clears throat> well, so, and then uh, DOD followed up saying that, well, so all which is left to finish this conjecture is a fairly small problem to prove, apparently fairly small problem, to prove that these little nests of little Mandelbrot sets shrink. So, <clears throat> well, so we know now that this problem turned out to be a big problem, and actually at this time, still, we cannot fully evaluate how big it is. So, but this, somehow this event, this jean Christophe's results, this development left a big, big impact on my future mathematical life. And today, in particular, I will add a token to this story. <clears throat> okay, so this story, after Jean-Christophe's work, this, uh, this story became a story of renormalization because uh, one way of formulating his result was that if the map is non-renormalizable or at most finitely renormalizable, then the Mandelbrot set is locally connected at the corresponding parameter value. So we need to, so to look at infinitely renormalizable parameter values and try to prove local connectivity of the Mandelbrot set at these parameter values. So these two stories, renormalization and problem of ML local connectivity merged. Well, or became somehow very strongly connected stories. <clears throat> okay, and so let me start with the, yeah, uh, with the general notion of renormalization. And let me tell you that actually, so today's talk is a continuation of my talk that I gave one year ago in Cancun. So, um, some refined version of that talk, but so uh, I'm not sure that everybody here were in Cancun, so I recap that story for people who were in Cancun and certainly remember everything. So just feel free to take a little nap and then you can wake up in, in half an hour or so. <clears throat> <clears throat> All right, so that is uh, the general picture of renormalization, very general idea of what renormalization is. We have some dynamical system, F, so some just map of some phase space, and we select our uh, favorite subset, and we consider the first return map to this subset, and then we uh, rescale this subset by some change of variables, which can be linear or non-linear for that matter, so to obtain a new map, which is called a uh, renormalization of the original one. So, of course, it would not make much sense if we did not have some good idea how this return map looks like. And basically, we want to have some space of dynamical systems for which the, we can make such a choice of the return map that the renormalization belongs to the same space. Renormalization belongs to the same class as we started with. Uh, and maybe we can repeat the story. Maybe we can find for, for this, in this phase space, we can find the next domain, some small domain, and look at the first return map, rescale, and obtain the second normalization, et cetera, et cetera. Maybe we will have to stop at some point, or maybe we can continue forever, so obtaining a map which is infinitely normalizable in this particular, in this particular sense. And if the map is infinitely normalizable, then basically we uh, have at least topological combinatorial understanding of this map in all scales. So because going through this normalization procedure 
corresponds to going through smaller and smaller and smaller scales, scales of the original map. Uh, however, that is not enough. We are more ambitious. We want to have some geometric understanding of our dynamical systems in, in all scales. And uh, this is usually formulated as a problem of a priori bounds. So if all these normalizations not only belong to a big class of dynamical systems, but they belong to some smaller class, which is compact inside of the big, then that is what is called a priori bounds. And it means that we have rough geometric control of uh, our original dynamical system in all scales. In all scales, there are some uniform bounds on how this dynamical system looks like. And that is certainly sounds like a very strong information indeed. But for some ambitious people, it's not even this is not enough. And there was some universality conjecture which was put forward in the 70s by physicists, by Feigenbaum, Collier Trussell. Charles Trussell is here, I guess. He's partly responsible for this, for this story. And so they came up with a conjecture in some particular case of unimodal maps which uh, sort of came from nowhere, basically. It was some experiments which would, could support, would support such a conjecture, but then it was an extremely, extremely strong conjecture that was put forward and whose importance became just bigger and bigger over, over, over time. So the, so the conjecture that under certain circumstances, not only our dynamical systems are roughly the same in small scales, but they are asymptotically the same in small scales. Just if we go deeper and deeper, then we cannot distinguish anymore between various maps in our, in our class. And so this asymptotical geometry, asymptotical small scale structure of our maps is controlled by the renormalization fixed point F star. So some map which is exactly preserved under the renormalization. And if you take any map which is infinitely normalizable, then these maps form a co-dimension or finite co-dimension in general. Or, so in our particular situations, it will be always co-dimension one, submanifold, which is a strong stable submanifold of manifold of these fixed points. So if you take any infinitely normalizable map and start to renormalize it, then the orbit of this map will converge exponentially fast to this fixed point. Yeah, by the way, so that is our space of maps. We started with, there is some fixed point of normalization. So, and now under normalizations, all infinite normalizable maps become more and more similar in deep scales to this universal fixed point. Uh -uh. So this, there is this universality of small scale structure for infinite normalizable maps. And also, if we go transversally to the strong stable manifold, if we start, efficiently change the combinatorics of the maps, then also we will observe bifurcation diagrams in these transverse families, and all these bifurcation diagrams also look asymptotically the same uh, near the corresponding infinitely normalizable parameters. And in particular, among these families, there is one special family, which is unstable manifold of zero normalization fixed point, and this unstable manifold is invariant under, uh, under normalization, and the normalization acts on this unstable manifold just as a scaling. So there is some scaling invariance of the bifurcations, di bifurcation diagrams in all one parameter families coming, starting with, from infinite normalizable maps. And moreover, the scaling factor is universal. It does not depend on the particular one parameter family that we are interested in. Yeah. So that was a sort of uh, an extremely strong conjecture put forward in the context of unimodal maps in the 70s by Feigenbaum, Collet, Reser, and then there were many and many other occasions when this kind of picture started to emerge, whereas depending on the class of maps, depending on the particular definition of normalization, et cetera, et cetera. And in this talk, in this story, today we will see at least three different uh, occasions of of renormalization structure, such renormalization structure. Okay, so, well, the moral of this story is roughly the same. So if you see, if you look at some uh, bifurcation locus, and if you see some similarity in the, some self-similarity in the bifurcation locus, 
then you may guess that there could be some renormalization scheme behind this self-similarity. There could be some such a hyperbolicity picture for the normalization operator, for certain normalization operator responsible for this self-similarity. So, and indeed, so let us look at our favorite bifurcation diagram, the monday broad set. And indeed, this monday broad set, it, so, uh, there are so quite a few self-similarity features in this bifurcation diagram, and so one, one of them is this one, this little copy of the monday broad set. Well, it's quite a big copy, actually, attached to this Dublin bifurcation point. There is a quite big copy. So, and then inside of this, there is another copy corresponding to next bifurcation, and there is another copy corresponding to next bifurcation, and they converge to the scale down to the Feigenbaum parameter. And that was ex actually a regional discovery that the, there is some universal scaling to this limiting parameter. So that is self-similarity structure, which leads to renormalization in the space of unimodal maps. So the space of unimodal maps is just one dimensional maps on the interval that look like that. Or in the complexified situation, the space of quadratic like maps. Quadratic like maps. So it is a double coverance, double coverance of a small, from a smaller disk to a bigger disk. So, uh, so there is one critical point. There is a Julia set, which can be defined as a set of non-escaping points from this smaller distance. So there is some, uh, the whole dynamical structure inside. And one can define certain doubling normalization in this space of maps. It was done by Doherty and Hubbard. And this kind of self-similarity can be explained from the point of view of this quadratic-like Doherty hubbard renormalization. Or you can go to triplings. Triplings, you can see, you see this little satellite copy, satellite copy of the Mandelbrot set, and inside there is another satellite copy of the Mandelbrot set, and then another, there is another one, and they converge to the analogous infinite normalizable point associated with triplings. All these situations are called satellite quadratic like normalizations because these little copies of the Mandelbrot set are attached to the main cardioid of the Mandelbrot set, they're satellite copies. There are many other so-called primitive copies. So we can, you can see a little dot here corresponding to primitive copy of the Mandelbrot set associated with period tripling. So it is another randomly selected primitive copy somewhere in the middle of the Mandelbrot set. They look all very much similar to the big Mandelbrot set. So clearly there is some self-similarity and there is a very good theory, quadratic like normalization, which can explain, which is responsible for this self-similarity of the Mandelbrot set. By the way, you can see that the difference between primitive renormalization and satellite is that in this Mandelbrot copy, you can really see the cusp, as in the big copy. And in the satellite copy, the cusp disappeared. It is attached to the main cardioid, and the cusp disappeared. So somehow this is an important difference between satellite and primitive copies, and it will, be, it will play its role today. Okay, but there are also other self-similarities that you can observe in the Mandelbrot set, namely if you look through the particular sequence of limbs of the Mandelbrot So the limbs are these parts of the Mandelbrot set attached to these bifurcation points. They are attached to rational bifurcation points with rational rotation number. And if you select particular sequence of limbs converging, whose bifurcation points converge to the golden mean, then you will see also a clear self-similarity picture. So here it is. So here is so two pictures you see uh, which look exactly the same. Actually, this one is the scaling of the previous one. You see the rotation number here is 55 over 144. We start here, very scale, and we see ex absolutely similar picture. So there is some scaled copies of limbs attached to the main cardioid. Then they converge to the golden the golden mean rotation number and. The question we asked ourselves is, so, so what kind of renormalization is responsible for, uh, could be responsible for this type of convergence and whether we can build up uh, some renormalization theory which would justify this scaling loss for these limbs of the monday broad set. Again, <coughs> the idea came from the old work by Brunner and Doherty from 80s 
who actually related the limbs, different limbs of the Mandelbrot set on the combinatorial level. So namely, they looked particularly on these two limbs, one half limb, this limb of the Mandelbrot set attached to the double normalization, and one third limb, this limb attached to one third to the parameter with rotation number one third, and they showed that one half limb can be topologically embedded into the one third limb. So there is an embedding of this one into that one. Oh, and there is a partial, so partial inverse map from one third to one half limb. And here is this map. So here is the rough description of the surgery. So one third limb is specified by the property that there are three ra rays landing at the certain fixed point. We have two fixed points. One of them is called alpha fixed point, interesting point called alpha fixed point. And there are three external rays landing at this fixed point, which are rotated with a rotation number one third. And in the one half limb, there are only two rays land landing at this alpha fixed point. So we have to do some procedure, some surgery, which reduces the number of rays from three to two. And so what they suggested, they just erased, erased this sector in between two limbs, identified this, identified these two rays dynamically. There is a map, dynamical map from one ray to another ray. So they identified, obtained some quotient, quotient plane. And then they defined now this map here, here as a second iterate of the map, because this sector goes to here, so and now this, this sector disappeared, so we have to take the second iterate of our original map on this sector, and we have, can take the, just the original map, the first iterate on the whole this domain, and there is one problematic sector, this one, which is the pre-image, another pre-image of that removed sector, and they did certain surgery, certain surgery, non-analytic non surgery on, on this map, quasi-conformal surgery, and then uh, conformally conjugate this quad obtained quasi-regular map to a quadratic polynomial, and this new quadratic polynomial was already, had already two rays instead of three rays. One ray was, one, one ray disappeared. And this surgery produced this um, partial homeomorphism from some part of the one third limb to onto the one half limb. Well, so this, that, is, that gave us an idea what, what kind of normalization we should consider in order to think about this uh, scaling of the limbs. Because here we have already some topological combinatorial relation between the limbs. The problem, of course, with this procedure is there is quasi-conformal surgery involved, and it is non-analytic operation. And so if you want to study surgery, you, you, if you want to study geometric scaling, you better define certain analytic operators. So we define some analytic operator, which is a kind of some lift of this D. Brunner operator. So here is our definition. So our class of maps is a class of Pac-Man. So let me introduce you, these guys. Please pay respect to them, because they have a big, greedy mouse, dangerous mouse, and so you should be careful with them. So, but so it is, this is just maps which are quite, look quite similar to quadratic light maps. Look, look, look quadratic light is just double coverance from a smaller disk onto a bigger disk. And here we have a, a domain like that, which is mapped onto a bigger domain almost as a double covering. Namely, if you remove in the image, we remove gamma one, and here we remove gamma zero, then we obtain a double covering from u minus gamma one to v minus, um, u minus gamma zero to v minus gamma one. But this boundary curves, boundary curves of this sector of the mouse of our Pac-Man, they both are mapped onto gamma one. So there is uh, this unpleasant, unpleasant twist in the quadratic-like situation. And this twist, of course, technically, creates a lot, a lot of problems. So, but it is our space of maps. And then in this space of maps, we define the Pac-Man normalization, just uh, similar to the uh, idea Brunner surgery. We just try to find some three rays, gamma naught, gamma one, gamma two, which, are, uh, so which appear in this order. And then we 
remove a sector between gamma one and gamma two and identify the boundary of this sector by the dynamics and define our map as F squared on this sector, F on the rest, except another pre-image of this sector. And so, but instead of doing surgery, instead of doing non, non-analytic quasi-conformal surgery, we just forget about this sector. We just throw it away, this sector. And then we will obtain some, after all these identifications and removal, we will obtain another Pac-Man. So here is the domain of this Pac-Man. So there is some step in the equipotential levels because we use different, different iterates of the map on different domains, F squared on one domain, F on the other, on the other domain. So, but it is a definition of Pac-Man normalization. So we have certain class of maps, we have certain uh, renormalization, renormalization operator, and now we can ask ourselves all these questions that I have posed in very general setting, whether we can prove some kind of a priori bounds, whether we can find a fixed point in this class of maps, and whether this point is hyperbolic with respect to the renormalization operator. And indeed, it turned out that all looks good, so that all the answers are positive, and it is our theorem with Nikita Selinger and Dima Dutko. Dima is here. So, which I actually announced already in Cancun. So, and it says that the Pac-Man normalization is, uh, at least, is this a, can, be a, can be interpreted, at least locally, as a holomorphic operator. Yeah, by the way, I should say that I need, in order to make this theorem correct, I need to remove a little neighborhood of the alpha prime point, of this point, which is a pre symmetric with the alpha point, pre-image of the alpha point. So this result that I'm formulated here is in this space of Pac-Man, Pac-Man which are slightly truncated uh, <coughs> near alpha prime. Also, it looks like technicality, but te this technicality makes the formulations a little bit slightly worse than one would like to. Uh -uh. Okay, uh, so um, there is uh, the fixed point for this normalization operator, and this, well, let us fix rotation. First of all, the fixed rotation numbers are our golden mean. Let us think about the golden mean. Or you can fix any quadratic uh, irrational with periodic, uh, with periodic continued fraction expansion. And so then the fixed point or corresponding periodic point for the corresponding, for this normalization operator is a Ziegel Pac-Man. So we have a, our Pac-Man map and you have a Ziegel fixed point inside and Ziegel disk around this Ziegel point. And what is important is that Ziegel disk is compactly contained in the domain of our, compactly contained in the domain of our Pac-Man. All this is incorporated in the term Ziegel, Ziegel Pac-Man. Uh, so on this domain, the map is linearizable. So it is our Ziegel disk, Ziegel disk on which the map is linearizable. And moreover, there is a critical point on the boundary of this map. There is a critical point on the boundary of this map. And the boundary of this map is not just some wild boundary, but it is Jordan curve, and actually it is a quasi-circle. So all this is part of the definition. So it is kind of very specific definition of what Ziegel Pac-Man is with good, various good properties, good properties of the corresponding Ziegel disk. Uh -uh. All right. So that is, the, that is how the fixed point for our normalization operator looks like. And so as I told you, there is so well there is this hyperbole. Hy hyperbolicity picture, so if we consider the space of our space of Pac-Man, some complex analytic space, there is a map of this Ziegel Pac-Man, which is a fixed point for the Pac-Man normalization, and it has co-dimension one stable manifold, and it has dimension one unstable manifold, so it is a hyperbolic fixed point, and the stable manifold consists of Ziegel Pac-Man, so all the maps, all the maps in the in the stable manifold are Ziegel Pac-Man like that. So, so we have here exponential fast convergence to F star under, under iterates of our Pac-Man renormalization, like that. And moreover, all these uh, Ziegel Pac-Man are, as we say in this field, in our field, 
uh, all these Siegel Pac-Man are hybrid equivalent to the fixed point, so or in between one one to another. So, <clears throat> so in hybrid equivalent, uh, it is better than topologically conjugate. It is better than quasi-conformally conjugate. The definition of hybrid equivalence is quasi-conformal conjugacy, which is conformal on the Siegel disk and automatically then on the all pre-images of this Siegel disk. That is the technical notion of hybrid equivalent. You may think that it is just quasi-conformal equivalence. All, all these guys in our stable manifolds are in the same, in the same quasi-conformal conjugacy class. <coughs> Well, and finally, unstable manifold has a nice parameter. Parameter there, it is just complexified rotation, complexified rotation number of the fixed point. So, so our Pac-Man have the fixed point, uh, and so the the rotation number parameterizes the unstable manifold. That is our hyperbolicity theorem, theorem which <coughs> uh, which we sort of designed in order to. Uh, explain this self-similarity. So I will uh, talk about the self-similarity, what are the consequences about the self-similarity a little bit later. But now I would like just to uh, give some historical perspective, so, so what had been done before, uh, so, and give some idea, some idea how this kind of results can be proved. So some steps of the results, and then we will discuss self-similarity and some implications for the MLC. <clears throat> All right, so, well, so and the very background of the theory is another normalization theory. It is the normalization theory for critical circle maps. So it is just, you, you take just the round circle and you consider real analytic, real analytic homeomorphisms of this circle map with one critical point, for instance, you could put it, in your favorite point on the circle. So, and this point is of cubic type. And so here I presented some story of the renormalization theory for in this class of maps. And actually the story is not quite complete. So, because the first step of the story was actually Yakoza's theorem, Ron Christoph's theorem, telling that all these critical circle maps are topologically well, with irrational rotation number, if it is, if such map has an irrational rotation number, then it is topologically conjugate to the rigid rotation uh, of the circle. So, or in other words, such maps don't have wandering intervals. So that was one of the first Yakoza theorem from early 80s, and everything else, of course, depends on this theory. On this theory. So I will not go will not go in detail for this story. You can roughly browse through uh, the steps. But so one important thing is we can think about the circle maps as a nonlinear interval exchange map. If we just cut the circle at one point, we obtain an interval, and then the circle map will become such a nonlinear interval exchange map just with two, with two intervals. And the normalization is defined well, in terms of continued fraction expansion for the rotation number, in some natural way, as the first return map, and it can be well defined in this class. So, was also <laughs> done by physicists first. And then there are certain a priori bounds, a priori bounds for in this class. And what is important, very important, that is complexification, complexification of this class of maps to butterflies. So instead of, instead of uh, looking only on the interval exchange map, so on the real line, we consider two domains, and each of these domains is mapped onto a bigger domain with some slits, with appropriate slits. So I'm not giving full definitions. It is a story from the 90s. It is also not, not a recent story uh, from the 90s. Uh, and uh, so one can prove, so it's a differential, uh, so introduce this butterfly, butterfly complexifications and prove a priori bounds in, for this butterfly, uh, butterfly maps. And then uh, together with Wellington and Demel and then by Jampolsky, the whole hyperbolicity picture was, was completed in this situation. So <clears throat> uh, yeah, why I'm telling you about this, uh, this class of maps, it looks like very different from what we are interested 
interested in, but this theory is on the background of the story I, I would like to tell you today, due to another surgery also from the 80s, it is Dodi Gis surgery, which allows to relate critical circle maps, as we defined on the previous slide, to Ziegel maps. So namely, to, so one can construct the quadratic polynomial, Ziegel quadratic polynomial, and I fix the rotation number for the moment, just fix the rotation number, which is a golden mean, your favorite uh, rotation number, which is quadratic irrational. And so, and one, one can take this class of Blaschke products, so with one parameter alpha. So these Blaschke products, they re restrict to the unit circle as a critical circle map, with a critical circle map with critical point here, and one can adjust this one parameter alpha so that the rotation number of these critical circle maps will be uh, as you, you'd like. So any rotation number can be obtained in this way. And so if your rotation number is a good rotation number, quadratic rational, then one can make a surgery to turn this picture of Blaschke product into the Ziegel picture for a quadratic polynomial. So to conjugate this, to conjugate Blaschke product appropriately changed by appropriate surgery to the Ziegel map. And it gives an extremely good control of Ziegel quadratic polynomials with this rotation, with rotation numbers of bounded, of bounded type. Because for the critical circle maps, we have this great control. So this great geometric control is there for critical circle maps. So we can we obtain some geometric control for Ziegel maps, but you can wonder whether the whole story now can be transferred, transferred from critical circle maps to Ziegel maps. It turns out that we are uh, not so fast, not so fast. We should slow down a little bit, and the reason is that there is again a surgery involved here, and the surgery is not an analytic operation, so we cannot immediately transfer the whole renormalization picture in this class of in the circle class of maps to the class of Ziegel maps, but we can do something. And so, well, here, by the way, here is a picture. So it is a Julia set for the quadratic polynomial with golden mean rotation number. Here is our Ziegel disk. Here is the critical point. This is pre-image, et cetera. And it is the, the part of the dynamical picture for the corresponding Blaschke product. You see that it is topologically the same picture. So there is a conjugacy between this picture, topological equivalence, quasi conformal equivalence between this picture and that picture. The whole picture for the Blaschke product is more involved. There is, more sim there is a symmetry involved and there is more structure. You should remove some, some of this structure to obtain this picture and then to conjugate it to the Ziegel picture. Anyway, so. There is a story which allows to transfer some useful information from the circle setting to the Ziegel setting due to the Dijis surgery. And it was used by Kurt McMullen in the 90s to establish, so to make the first step in the direction of the universality picture, namely Kurt proved that there is, there is a, well, first of all, one can define properly renormalization in the Ziegel maps using this butterfly, butterfly picture that for the circle maps. Part of the butterfly picture, our exterior part of the butterfly picture is here. So it is attached to our Ziegel disk. There are two half disks which are mapped onto a bigger disk with, onto a bigger disk, uh, half, onto a bigger disk, so univalently. And this is a, uh, this is a class of maps in, uh, so where you can define renormalization, it's appropriate for the turn map, and Kurt proves that in this class of these butterfl Ziegel butterflies, there is a fixed point, and actually if you start with a quadratic polynomial, if you start with a quadratic polynomial, then under this Ziegel renormalization, the quadratic polynomial will converge exponentially fast to this fixed, fixed point. Uh -uh. Uh, still, the, so after that, the question remained whether this fixed point is hyperbolic under this normalization, this co-dimension one stable manifold, this one dimensional unstable manifold parameterized by the rotation number, and this question remained unsettled for some time. So in the case of the, oops, sorry, so in the case 
of golden mean rotation number, there was a fairly recent work by Galdashev and Yampolsky who confirmed the hyperbolicity conjecture for Ziegler normalization, so using computer assistance, so computer assisted proof of the hyperbolicity of the corresponding normalization operator, so, so along the, similar to what Lanford did long ago for the Dublin renormalization. And on the other hand, along completely different lines, Ina and Shishikura, about 10 years ago, established hyperbolicity of the fixed points and existence by different methods, existence and hyperbolicity of the Ziegler normalization fixed point if the rotation number is of sufficiently high type. This high type is still, so let us consider still stationary times, let it be quadratic irrational still, but the entries, the entries are sufficiently, the entries are sufficiently high. So it is totally uh, different methods based on the uh, machinery of parabolic perturbations. And that is where the theory st had stood before our Pacman theorem. So there was Ziegler normalization was developed fully, hyperbolicity for Ziegler normalization was fully developed in, the, in this case of uh, golden mean computer assisted and for high type by Ina Shishikura. So, and so you can, so in particular what our Pacman normalization theorem does, it fills in all the gaps. So now you can take any uh, irrational rotation number, which is quadratic irrationals, irrational of periodic type, and there is an associated renormalization periodic point. So, and this associated renormalization periodic point is a hyperbolic periodic point, and the space is an upgraded space of maps. It is not just Ziegel maps, Ziegel maps for which these all theorems were established, it is some small neighborhoods of the Ziegel disk. Some small neighborhoods of Ziegel disks which are not very well controlled, so we have some, we upgraded it to Pacman neighborhoods of the Ziegel disk which are almost like quadratic-like setting. Uh -uh. <clears throat> okay, so that is where, where we, we stood. Uh -uh. And so uh, now let me, uh, let me uh, give you a, an idea of some steps of the proof of the Pacman renormalization theorem. So the renormalization theorem, the theorem which says that the Pacman renormalization as defined before in the class of Pacman maps, which are still here de depicted here, is hyperbolic. <clears throat> okay, so first step is to take uh, McMullen's fixed point Ziegel for Ziegel renormalization and to promote this fixed point to the Pacman normalization fixed point. So, and it is uh, as, uh, related to the notion of a pre-Pacman, pre-Pacman. So what is pre-Pacman? So it is kind of like relation between circle maps and interval exchange maps. So relation between Pacman and pre-Pacman is similar to these circle maps versus interval exchange maps. So here is our Pacman, if you cut your disk along this uh, ray gamma one, then you obtain such a sector, and on this sector you obtain two maps, one on this sector, another on that one. On this one, or oh, on this one, sorry, on this one is on this one, another is on that one. And this green sector will be univalently mapped onto some sector here, and this red sector will be mapped with a critical point, with degree one and a half, so onto another domain. So there will be this, so holomorphic exchange of two domains, uh, so with a, but not, not univalent maps, of course, involved here, but critical maps. And so, vice versa, if we have such a pre pacman picture, we can glue back the boundary components, boundary arrays, and obtain a Pacman. So you can go back and forth at will, so between Pacman and pre pacman And so what we did is we took the Ziegel renormalization, Ziegel fixed point, so that is our Ziegel disk, and we built up such a pre pacman using some external rays and equipotential structure outside of the Ziegel map. And once we have this pre pacman we can project it to a Pacman by gluing the rays, and this will be the fixed point in the class of Pacman. So that is how the story starts, just upgrading uh, the existing fixed point for Ziegel maps to a Pacman. Then uh, we would like to consider the stable manifold 
of this fixed point. We already have fixed point we would like to consider as a stable manifold. And we want to interpret this stable manifold as a hybrid class of our uh, fixed points. So to say that all this pre-Pacman, all this Pacman in the stable manifold are hybrid equivalent. And it is uh, uh, the, the description, the description of our stable manifold. And it can be done by the methods which were developed by Sullivan, Macmillan, Arthur Avila, and myself. So these methods can be adapted to this situation to make this second step and to study the stable manifold. This table, but in this stage, we know only that this stable manifold would be some co-dimension, finite co-dimension sub-manifold of our, of our fixed point. We don't know that. <coughs> Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we cannot say that it's co-dimension one. On the other hand, we know that the dimension of the unstable manifold is at least one. We know that there is at least one unstable, unstable eigenvalue. That's be, for very simple reason, because we know how our Pac-Man normalization acts on the rotation numbers, and it is expanding action. So we have a jump, we have a jump of the unstable manifold parameterized by the rotation number. So we, so we have now, you see, uh, some finite co-dimensions, stable manifold, which is also a hybrid class, and we have one-dimensional part of, of unstable manifold. It's not yet a hyperbolicity picture. We want to obtain a true hyperbolicity picture, so we want stable and unstable manifold to be transverse, and unstable manifold to, to have dimension, the right dimension, dimension one because it is the dimension of the natural parameter spaces in this, in this story. <clears throat> so, okay, so, uh, well, uh, so let us, let us take a look at our unstable manifold. So we don't know, we know that it is at least one dimensional, at least one dimensional, but maybe it is high dimensional. So it is our unstable manifold, some finite dimensional, finite, Finite dimensional submanifold. Let me draw it like that. So some finite dimensional submanifold in our space. So and we want to argue that it is one dimensional. And the good thing that as long as the map belongs to this unstable manifold, it can be anti-renormalized infinitely many. And this anti-renormalizations exponentially fast converge to the fixed point. So by this definition of the unstable manifold. So, and it gives a very nice control of the maps F in our unstable manifold. So, and namely it turns out and that there is, so it is a technical statement which is not very easy to prove, but there is a global analytic extension, global analytic extension of any map in our unstable manifold to a transcendental map from some domain W, some domain W onto the complex plane. And this transcendental map is sigma proper in the sense that it can be exhausted by a nest of branch coverings of finite degree. Uh -uh. So, uh, so you have our, our unstable manifold becomes a family of transcendental, of transcendental maps and with some, with some transcendental maps, certainly uh, difficult creatures to deal with, but still it is some which has nice global structure. And in particular, it allowed us to capture the critical point, at least under some circumstances, to capture the critical, the critical orbit uh, under the iterates of our map. So if you take, uh -uh, so if you take our Pac-Man, if you take our Pac-Man map, so, then the critical point a priori can escape through this dangerous mouse, and then we lose everything. So it is a very bad situation. However, we showed that if we have here some map G, which is which has Ziegler, which has golden mean rotation number, which has the same rotation number as the fixed point, then for this map the critical orbit does not escape the critical orbit, uh, the critical point, so it is, should be here. Here is my fixed point, so it's my fixed point in the origin, and it's my critical point, and this critical point is not, does not escape under dynamics. It goes around and around and around, and then one can show that 
actually using this lambda lemma argument, simple lambda lemma argument, it shows that actually this critical orbit fills in the quasi-circle, quasi-circle compactly contained, compactly contained in the uh, domain of our Pac-Man. And this would allow us to go further to show that this Pac-Man is actually, that this Pac-Man, that this, this Pac-Man is actually, actually hybrid equivalent to F star, but we know from the previous results that if it is hybrid equivalent to F star, then under normalizations, it will converge exponentially fast to F star, so it must be in the stable manifold rather than in the unstable manifold, and that is the contradiction. So that is how contradiction comes from, contradiction with the assumption that our unstable manifold has dimension greater than one. And it shows that, it shows that the unstable manifold is one dimensional, dimensional stable is equal one. And the last step, still, so we, it does not give hyperbolicity we can, because we can have some neutral directions in the stable manifold, neutral directions in the stable manifold, but it can be ruled out also by some old arguments that I used in the quadratic-like settings, so-called small orbits, small orbits arguments. So, and that is roughly how this renormalization, renormalization theorem uh, is proved. That is a kind of the main steps, but it is, actually it is quite technical and of course all, all technicalities, technicalities are related to the mouse, to the mouse, to, when, to make sure that certain domains, certain orbits don't, are not swallowed by this greedy mouse. <clears throat> All right, so now let me uh, go forward. So yeah, it is actually some illustration, that is an illustration of uh, how one globalizes the um, maps how one makes how one makes the analytic extension of the maps in the stable manifold so uh, so it is uh, so the procedure uh, <clears throat> so you just take you just take this map and take its anti normalization and another anti normalization and you can use these anti normalizations in order to produce this global structure so let me not not go through that in detail, uh, uh, but uh, so. But our next question, our next question we wandered around is, what is this uh, global? How these global transcendental maps look like, and what is the stable unst unstable manifold as a parameter space of these transcendental maps? Well. So transcendental maps, so it is a, a part of holomorphic dynamics which used to be quite marginal. So at somehow there were certainly many very interesting and beautiful results, but it was no, never in the center of the world. And recently in the past 10 years, the station started to, to change. So the results start to more and more, so deep and interesting results started to emerge. And actually this trans transcendental dynamics started to emerge from all Sides. So just whenever you look at some problems, even in the quadratic dynamics, just all of a sudden you face some problems in transcendental dynamics. And it is this kind of situation, exactly this kind of situation that we faced here. We look at our unstable manifold, and this unstable manifold is some transcendental family of maps. And so how to deal with transcendental family of maps? So the starting point for the quadratic maps is to look from outside, from infinity. There is a nice basin of infinity. And for transcendental maps, we don't have this basin of infinity. However, people who have been working in this field notice that there is some decent replacement for the basin of infinity. There is still some escaping locus, for instance, in the exponential family. At least in the family is good enough. Some exponential family of some other decent family of maps, then there are some escaping loci. And this escaping loci the sets of escaping points, they give us some external structure, even when the Julia set is the whole plane. And one can use this external structure, external structure to understand the dynamics of individual maps and of parameter spaces. And that is exactly what uh, happened here. So you don't need to read 
through this technical slide, but the meaning of this slide is that, for example, we can start with the Ziegel map, and you have such a nice external structure. So this red, red guys are kind of external rays, and these external rays, they form some tree-like structure with branching in some particular dynamical points. They keep branching and branching, and you somehow have some combinatorial partition of the dynamical plane for the Ziegel map Ziegel Pacman extend, extended analytically to the whole complex plane. And you can do the similar thing anywhere in the unstable manifold. You can consider escaping locus, escaping set for any map in the unstable manifold. For instance, here is a, the picture for the parabolic map. So that is a kind of parabolic basin with point at infinity, which is parabolic point. Uh, so, and also you have this branch, branch structure for the escaping locus, so you, you see this white regions are escaping loci, or it is a picture of transcendental of the basilica map in the unstable manifold, also with some external structure. And so you can just study this external structure for all of these maps to see that there is this branch, branch tree external structure for these transcendental maps. And then you can try to transfer this structure to the parameter plane. And our parameter plane is actually this unstable manifold, a local unstable manifold, which actually can be globalized, globalized by normalizations. And so you can study the corresponding parameter race, parameter escaping loci, and in this, in this study. So again, I don't suggest you to read this uh, technical slide, I will show you the picture momentarily, but so the, what part of the story depends on the cost inequality, on the size of the limbs of the Mandelbrot set, which can be applied to our transcendental situation. So the method can be applied to our transcendental situation too, and it is important part of the story, which allows to construct such wakes, wakes in the parameter domain. So you see it is some parameter race, it is uh, the parameters for which the critical value escapes. The critical value belongs to the escaping set, to the corresponding escaping set, and there is also this branch structure for uh, these parameter rates, and one can find a particular wake which turns out to be a bounded set, and this bounded, boundedness exactly depends on the cause inequality. And there is some, some pinched quadratic-like family of maps moving, moving holomorphically over some holomorphic family of pinched quadratic-like maps which moves over this transcendental wake. So somehow the quadratic story can be to some extent transferred to here, to this transcendental, transcendental dynamics. And with this structure in hands, we can prove two more results. It is work in progress, so not yet fully written with Dima Dutko. So the first theorem is that the little copies of the Mandelbrot set in the, in the right parameters value scale as they're supposed to be scaled. So I don't go to the picture. It is like, and that picture that I showed you in the very big, ah, it is, well, some rough picture is here. So there is this, well, the caricature is here, but you saw the real picture. So there is this uh, little copies of the Mandelbrot set which converge to the golden mean and they scale down with the, with the right, right scale in law, which is the golden mean to the power two minus n. They should be truncated a little bit. This truncation, I want you in the beginning that Pacman, our Pacman, Pacman must be truncated a little bit near the mouse and this leads here to the truncation of little copies so that makes result a, a little bit Worse that we would like to. So, but still, up, except truncation near certain tips, these copies scale down in the right scale. And also, we have some class of satellite infinite normalizable parameters for which the Mandelbrot set is locally connected. So, what is this class? So, well, so I, <coughs> this satellite normalization is associated. Well, I, I never defined you what is satellite normalization, but it's associated with satellite copies of the Mandelbrot set. To each of these copies, there is a corresponding normalization, quadratic light normalization associated. So, and the domain for this normalization is just the following. Here is our 
alpha fixed point, alpha prime fixed point, and we have to consider the return maps to this domain, to this central domain, so under Q iterates. That is a satellite normalization associated to, uh, to this satellite copies of the Monday broad set. And if you take satellite copy of big, of big order, then the corresponding satellite normalization can be factored out through Pac-Man normalization. You go, go, go through Pac-Man normalization and then apply the satellite normalization associated with this copy. We factor it out. And this Pac-Man normalization are nice hyperbolic uh, operators. So you accumulate a lot of hyperbolicity once you go through this, uh, through this Pac-Man normalization. At the last moment you apply one satellite normalization and it spoils the things a little bit, but not enough if, if, you're, if you went to sufficiently deep copy. So using Pac-Man normalization, we can produce a class of infinitely normalizable, of infinitely normalizable parameter values of bounded satellite type, basically stationary satellite type, for which uh, uh, the one at, for which the Mandelbrot set is locally connected. So, and to be honest here, I should say that I put here secondary, secondary copy. Actually, we need to make the story precise. We need actually to consider not the first satellite copy, but some secondary satellite copy of the Mandelbrot set and the normalization associated to this secondary Mandelbrot copy. And then what I have said before can be can be justified. So, and the last sentence is that, uh, again, so on the level of the Mandelbrot set, all these operators are nonlinear operators, well, not just nonlinear, but they are non-smooth transformations. It is just quasi-conformal maps or even just with some problems in the cast. <laughs> so it is topological maps from one copy to another copy, but we know how to lift these maps to the analytic space to the uh, upgrade uh, this, this, this non-smooth rescaling to analytic rescaling. And in the space of this analytic Pac-Man, we would have such a homoclinic picture for people who like homoclinic bifurcations. Here it is, it appears naturally. In this context, you consider the space of Pac-Man and you select appropriately the point so that you normalize, normalize, normalize it many times by the Pac-Man normalization and then you apply the satellite, one satellite normalization and you can create this horseshoe type picture which creates for you a hyperbolic fixed point but now it is a hyperbolic fixed point for the satellite quadratic-like renormalization associated with the secondary copy of the Mandelbrot set. Thank you.